Welcome. Welcome to the Black Table. My name is Greg Carr. Um, I am a proud member of the Black Star Network. Uh, I teach at Howard University in the Department of Afro-American Studies. And I'm also an adjunct professor at the Howard University School of Law. And most importantly, I am a listener, a teacher, and uh, one more member of our continuing struggle to try to think through and understand how to create a better society. And so this program, The Black Table, is dedicated to that purpose. Um, we are uh, about reframing the way we think about topics and ideas and concepts and, and issues that we think we know about, but we want to create new spaces to think differently about how to resolve some of the issues that face us in contemporary society. We want to apply that critical lens to topics across the full range. And we want to leave everybody thinking, how can we be better prepared to act? Uh, today, um, we are very, very excited uh, in our inaugural conversation uh, to welcome into the conversation uh, some very important thinkers in an intergenerational dialogue around a topic these days. The, the topic is our historically black colleges and universities. I'm a product of an HBCU, Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee, and I can say very easily that without that faculty at Tennessee State University, Jamie Williams, McDonald Williams, Lois McDougall, William Dury Cox, Hoyt King, and so many others, names that you might not know, but names that as you are listening, you can slot in the names of the folks who uh, taught you K-12, caught you in, in undergraduate and graduate school and so forth. Without those people, I wouldn't be here uh, at the center of this conversation we're gonna have today around the black table. And so we thought that this initial conversation we would launch, would help us launch the Black Table, would be uh, one that would be important to center some voices that represent the best of the thinking tradition around the topic of the past, present, and future of HBCUs, of historically Black colleges and universities. And, and so to do that, I'm going to introduce uh, three people. Uh, two longtime intellectuals, partners in this intellectual work, uh, not only around the topic of historically black colleges, universities, but the broader concept of how we think black act, black do black across the range. And uh, then we're going to introduce a brother who, uh, like myself, is in that following generation who apprenticed with these master teachers uh, and their colleagues and who have taken up the challenge that they laid out for us to continue this work of really working through what we're going to talk about today in the context of HBCUs, the concept of the Black University. So first we have uh, Dr. Andrew Billingsley and Amy Tate Billingsley. Dr. Andrew Billingsley uh, is a distinguished professor emeritus at the University of South Carolina Institutes of Family and Society. But uh, before that, he's, he held a number of academic appointments. He was the president of Morgan State University in Baltimore. Um, and also before that, he was the vice president for academic affairs at Howard University. Uh, when he left the University of California, Berkeley to come uh, east to help Howard University become the black university. We're going to get into that whole conversation in a minute. Dr. Billingsley is a highly regarded author. Uh, many of you have probably heard of his work. Uh, his probably best known work is a book called Black Families in White America. Um, Climbing Jacob's Ladder, another of his texts. Uh, Children of the Storm, Mighty Like a River, The Black Church, and Social Reform. Uh, one of his more recent works is his book, Yearning to Breathe Free, Robert Smalls in South Carolina and his family. And um, I want to highlight this particular book because this book is hot off the press and you need to get this book immediately. This is Andrew Billingsley, scholar and institution builder, essays and tributes edited by his friend Charles Jarman, where he collects a number of folk who gathered for his 90th birthday celebration when he was uh, and remains in, in, in the position of the John and Eula Cleveland chair at Afro American Studies at Howard University. We asked him to come back and he uh, graciously agreed. And at his 90th birthday, 90th birthday symposium, he convened along with his team, uh, a really a constellation of scholars to talk about how they tried to build and in fact did build the black university in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, sitting there with him is uh, his partner, Amy Tate Billingsley. This sister 
is a towering intellectual out of Chicago, Illinois, um, raised in Chicago and uh, went off to, got a, got a degree from back from the University of Chicago and then went to the Ohio State University and then the University of Baltimore, has traveled the world, uh, working very early in her intellectual work uh, with the Republic of Senegal and Operations Crossroads, uh, came back, worked at Harvard for a while at the Center for Research and Study of Personality. And then she partnered up with uh, Dr. Billingsley at the time. He was at Brandeis as a, as, a, uh, as, as a student, and they began their intellectual work together. Uh, mm -hmm. She contributed mightily to Black families in white America, as I mentioned. And we also, uh, she then began, when they moved out west to California, uh, she got involved in politics, helping get Tom Bradley elected <laughs> mayor of Atlanta. I'm sorry, mayor uh, 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 of Los Angeles. I'm, I got ahead of myself because she helped uh, Andrew Young win his congressional seat in Atlanta. And uh, from there, she has worked in a number of roles, including with the Clinton administration, the White House public liaison. Um, she worked as a program manager for the White House initiative on HBCUs and also worked with Secretary Alexis Herman, Secretary of Labor. Um, a couple of other things, uh, she was a founder of Black Women's Agenda and uh, has served on the National Black MBA Association. And we're gonna talk a lot more about her contemporary work. She's worked as a consultant for a number of institutions, including the History Makers, which is a very important entity. If you don't know about the History Makers out of Chicago, you really need to know, maybe you can say some more about that, uh, Sister Amy, in a moment. And we will be joined, so welcome, Sister Amy. And, and we're going to be joined in, in, a, in a generational dialogue with uh, one of our brothers, who's one of my age mates, and that's uh, Dr. Jelani Favors. Dr. Jelani Favors, uh, my brother, in fact, um, in fact, I, I'll say this before I say anything else. Uh, if you have not gotten this book, you need to get it. It's called Shelter in a Time of Storm. Um, I have my hardback copy is in the other room, but I had <laughs> you can get that as an ebook format as well. How black colleges foster generations of leadership and activism. This book really sets the framework in so many ways for what we'll be talking about today. Um, Dr. Favors is a native of Winston-Salem, North Carolina and went to North Carolina A&T. Uh, he has circled through a number of institutions. Uh, he went to graduate school and taught at uh, Ohio State University, where he got a master's in African American studies and a, and a, and a doctorate in history. Uh, came through Morgan State. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> we had this conversation today, uh, Jelani, with Dr. Billingsley, who used to run Georgia State. I have a feeling if Dr. Billingsley had been the president of Morgan State, you'd probably still be there. He wouldn't let you get away. But he cycled through several institutions before. This is very exciting, uh, everyone. Uh, before. Uh, in late uh, 2021, September 2021, the North Carolina uh, Agricultural and Technical State University, Aggie Pride, brought him home and brought him home to occupy uh, a chair, a distinguished uh, chair named for uh, Professor Fry, Henry E. Fry, who's an American judge, politician, served as the first African-American chief justice of North Carolina Supreme Court. And I'm very excited today because, uh, in addition, by the way, his book, Shelter in the Time of Storm, uh, Storm won the 2020 Stone Book Award. Uh, that is a prize that is presented by the Museum of African American History in Boston. And it's very important as well. Um, he also won the Lillian Smith Book Award, the Southern Regional Council and the University of Georgia Library selected Shelter in the Time of Storm. And there are a number of other things we could talk about, and we're going to get right into it now. Um, but I thought that it's very important for us to start with that introduction at the beginning of this uh, first convening of the Black Table so that folk understand that one of our other objectives is to bring into conversation some of the most important thinkers and actors that we can identify and recruit into the conversation uh, with an emphasis on folks who you might not be as aware of as you should be aware of, who don't uh, often uh, get called on as much as they should in white facing media. Uh, we, I'd call it mainstream, but this is the mainstream. We, this, this is our mainstream. So with that in mind, I wanna bring everybody back into the conversation um, and start with a question around the history of HBCUs. And I'd like to frame it a little bit uh, ask you all about the history of HBCUs, and perhaps we'll start with you, um, Professor Favors. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, ask you maybe to frame it in terms of 
a recent article. This is an article that appeared in the summer 2021 issue of The Point, which is a journal. Um, Dr. Favors published an article called The Second Curriculum, where he opens that conversation about HBCUs and the whole issue, the, the article is about HBCUs. But he talks about one of his professors, Wayman McLaughlin. And Dr. Favors, if you don't mind helping us, when we say the 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 when we say HBC, when we say historically black college and university for folks who either you know, think they know or may not know much at all, what is an HBCU? And give us some of the history of, of HBCUs in terms of their importance, what the role of faculty uh, and what they really what they really do and have done in the past. Well, first of all, again, thank you so much, um, Greg, for inviting me to, to be with you here today. It is an absolute, I'm usually honored to be with you. I'm even more honored to, to, to share the stage with the Billingsley. So uh, it is just an absolute honor to join you on what is today the second day of, of Kwanzaa, Habari Ghani. And of course, the response to that today is Kuji Chakalia, right? And Kuji Chakalia emphasizes the idea of self-determination. Right. And so what we clearly understand about the legacy of HBCUs is that they were never really about what white folks could do on behalf of black people. Right. That's always been sort of the general um, assumption is that, you know, through white philanthropy and white benefactors that these institutions um, developed and emerged in the shadows of slavery. And in doing so, they shaped generations of, of young black folks to uh, fall in line with the expectations of a Jim Crow society. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, it was always about how black folks shaped and carved out these spaces to meet their needs. Uh, and emerging out of slavery, even before slavery ends in 1865, beginning in 1837 with the founding of the Institute for Colored Youth, which would later go on to become Cheney State University, uh, as well as those other two institutions that emerge in the midst of the antebellum era, Wilberforce, as well as Lincoln University. These institutions and spaces were directly linked with the freedom dreams of black folks. How could they use these spaces to empower generations of young African-Americans to reject the principles of white supremacy, um, which taught, which tried to teach uh, uh, the idea that black folks uh, had no dignity, had no humanity, had no culture, had no history. Uh, and immediately out the gate, um, th there's a different blueprint that's going to emerge uh, within these institutions, spaces where again, young black folks their freedom dreams can soar unimpeded. They can see themselves as a continuation of the black liberation struggle. They can use their voices, their talents, their skills to speak towards the idea of deconstructing white supremacy, of deconstructing Jim Crow and building, as you said earlier, Greg, a, a better and more tolerant and more just society. Uh, and that is radically different. You mentioned the, 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 um, essay that I wrote for The Point magazine. They, I was asked to write that essay, and, and the theme was, what is the university for? And what is very clear is that, again, beginning in 1837, um, within the academic circles, HBCUs are going to be radically different spaces than their PWI counterparts. Again, they will be spaces where, which will train the future generations of young activists, uh, engaged citizens, who again, use their talents, their skills, their abilities um, to think about how they could build a more tolerant and more inclusive society. And again, that is so radically different than what, from what PWIs were doing um, during that same time. You know, again, we're talking about the antebellum era where, you know, they were studying skull sizes and, and the inferiority of black folks and referring to Africa as the dark continent. Uh, meanwhile, again, black folks are exposed to what I refer to as the second curriculum. Um, which emphasize race consciousness, idealism, and cultural nationalism. How do we build, again, in the spirit of self-determination, how do we build spaces uh, and, and build movements uh, which will push Black folks forward? Uh, and, and that is, again, radically different from what PWIs were doing. And this is why HBCUs are so important. It's, a, it's always been about family, about belonging, about making people um, feel as though they were part of something bigger than themselves. Um, you mentioned your uh, um, 
maturation at Tennessee State University. I lead that article off in the point discussing and talking about uh, my ancestors, my professors, uh, who, who, as one of my uh, um, dissertation advisors, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, like to say, as he was reading my, my earlier work in, in, in this uh, area, it's almost as if there was a laying on of hands tradition, like in the tradition of the black church, right, of I'm going to pass on a mission and a purpose to you. That's what people like Dr. Wayman McLaughlin did for me. Uh, and he, of course, had been impacted uh, in that same way as a former student at Virginia Union University. So um, this is that legacy of passing on that torch of, of racial responsibility, of building a better society, of understanding your, your, your purpose. Uh, and I am thankful to be a, a benefactor of that. And I am even more thankful that now I have the opportunity to return to my alma mater and continue in that same tradition, passing on that legacy uh, and that charge, that mission um, to current generations of, of young black students. Thank you, Jelani. This is, man, this is so powerful. You know, you had a couple of, uh, as you were talking, I'm reflecting on something you wrote, uh, several things you wrote in, in, in the article that you referred to. And you you raised something so powerful, brother, when you said that uh, questioning and seeking to amend the contradictions in American society became a major byproduct of black education. And I thought that your crafting, your, your, your narrating that struggle as a byproduct rather than the center or purpose of those institutions was very powerful. Um, as we get ready to, to bring the Billingsleys into the conversation, I want to ask you about the importance of faculty, because every, every I mean, you've talked about it already. And, and you mentioned, of course, uh, Brother McLaughlin, Dr. McLaughlin, Professor McLaughlin, who um, taught, your, taught your parents, which I thought was striking, very striking. And, and and then tended tended to you in a forty year career that that included many HBCUs, and of course his jagnus his mentors at Virginia Union and made me think of course of Jeremiah Wright Senior, the father of Jeremiah Wright Junior, who uh, was the first in his family to go to college, whose father sent him to Virginia Union with a, with twenty five cents, <laughs> as as Reverend Wright tells the story to go and it, and it altered the trajectory of his entire uh, family. And not just his family, but our people. And 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 one of the things that today I know we will talk about in a, a great deal is how that second curriculum, as you described it, as you have named it and given voice to something that we all experienced, including, of course, our friend Hassan Jeffries, who came out of Morehouse. Right? Mm -hmm. That that second curriculum, there was a moment that you emphasized not only in Shelter in the Time of Storm, your book but that you emphasize in this article where there was a push uh, by students uh, primarily to make that second curriculum the first curriculum. Could you say a little bit about that? And then we'll bring in uh, perhaps the single most uh, knowledgeable from experience authority, living authority in the world on that attempt. But uh, could you say a little bit about <laughs> what was that about trying to make the second curriculum that you talk about the first? Well, I mean, a lot of it was just simply about interrogating um, these critical and, and vitally important spaces um, at the apex of, of the Black Power era, um, where emphasis was increasingly being put on the same curriculum, right? The idea of racial, racial consciousness and cultural nationalism and Black folks um, were using that moment, that historical moment, that historical crossroads um, to think about how they could even intensify that even more without apology. Um, you know, much of the second curriculum, much of the work of the second curriculum was often done in the shadows. It was often done uh, in the, these, these spaces that were carved out. Uh, and these are all, again, critically important and vital spaces. Um, office hours with students uh, where uh, teaching, you know, and, and lecturing at these institutions where a professor and teacher may be feeling the heat, especially if you taught at a place like Tennessee State University or Florida A&M or Alabama State University, may be feeling the heat um, from uh, um, state, uh, uh, white state legislators who control the purse strings of these institutions who were, were vehemently opposed to anything radical, uh, any, any 
distinct essence of dissent emerging on these campuses. But it's something powerful about, again, that space, about a teacher being able to close their, their classroom door and to begin having these conversations. My friend Jarvis Gibbons at Harvard University just produced an incredible book on Carter G. Woodson. And, and when you think about the legacy of Carter G. Woodson and the work that he was doing, HBCUs are so incredibly vital to that. You know, yes, you have the, the, the legacy of black educators in high schools and, and, and middle schools and elementary schools, but all of these teachers were being trained at HBCUs, right? And, and so uh, that work began uh, in terms of their preparation, in terms of understanding how to, 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 to navigate these often hostile spaces, it began within the spaces of, of black colleges. And so, um, you know, when you look at the 1960s, so many frustrated um, young black activists were saying, look, you know, we don't want to work out of the shadows anymore. This should be forthright. It should be uh, singular. It, it should be uh, we should, as they said at Howard University, we should move toward a black university. Right. Uh, and so there was so much questioning and so much uh, interrogation around around that idea about um, how do we uh, uh, make these institutions um, even more uh, I I important and central to the black liberation struggle. Uh, and that brought out people like Dr. Billings, Dr. Billings Leeds and, and so many other uh, folks associated with these institutions who, who try to, to elevate that conversation, but also push these institutions closer towards uh, the freedom dreams of all black folks, the masses of black folks, uh, um, not just the black middle class, uh, not just the black working class. How do we have an honest conversation about the failures and the trappings of American capitalism and white supremacy as it is uh, deeply fortified within in every institution within within the United States of America, and this is what young activists were were calling for and, and, and demanding, uh, and it was a challenge for uh, um, administrators and for educators at these institutions to begin having some of those hard conversations about how do we make these institutions and these spaces more relevant um, and and uh, um, uh, central to the freedom dreams of all Black people. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, an unresolved conflict and uh, an unresolved challenge, it seems to me. And and you've written about and talked about and, you know, those of us who pay particularly attention to W.E.B. Du Bois's discussion of HBCUs and the role of black universities in this continuous work that we have to do. Uh, we've paid particularly attention to the particular attention to his commencement speeches, his discussions with educators around this topic. And there was one in particular there nearby Johnson C. Smith University where he and uh, his wife, Shirley Graham, went down to a meeting of the social scientists, the black uh, social studies, actually teachers, K-12 and university. And he gave a talk with her now and why. Where he says these laws are gonna change. And then you're gonna have to ask yourself, what then is the function and purpose of black teachers and black education in a society where the laws have changed, but you haven't decided what you're going to be. And this of course is a theme that he takes up in the early 20th century at Fisk and at Hampton, at Howard and many other places, Marshall College. And Du Bois of course tries with the Atlanta University studies to establish maybe a foundation for what a black university might be. But as you were talking, Jelani, it just resonates so deeply that you say that a lot of this work was had to take place in the shadows and even taking place in the shadows, how it informed and shifted. I mean, you wrote about, for example, what happened uh, with Professor Higgins, Rodney Higgins at Southern University when the president of Southern Clark, Felton Clark, brought him down there and to build that political science department. And then we get Jewel Crestage, we get Mac Jones and the Atlanta University School. And so folks now might see an Adolph Reed Jr., but they may not know about Adolph Reed Sr. and right. the connection to political science. So as you were talking and really leading us through this unresolved tension about what we can do with these HBCUs, and it really does bring a fundamental question that we're going to ask in a second the billings lease to begin to approach as to you know what what was achieved in the attempt to make that second curriculum the first curriculum and you know what maybe are the implications going forward in terms of the current state of hbcus and, and you mentioned uh your brother jarvis Givens and you know read fugitive pedagogy an excellent book and uh at the same time i said to myself it's not fugitive 
it was not fugitive to those who were in undertaking it. And with all due respect to uh, Professor Givens at, at Harvard and Professor Jeffries at Ohio State, we made a deliberate choice to come into black college spaces and teach, research, work, serve. And that is because I think those of us who did that, you, myself, and so many others whose names and whose work isn't featured in these white stream spaces necessarily. Um, we did that because we know that we not only owe a debt, but we're still struggling to resolve those fundamental contradictions. And class does play such a central role. And brother, you just, I mean, those everyone watching, this is what the Black Table is about. We, we, again, a different lens, another grounding, and it's probably going to resonate with folks saying, finally, we had a place where we had these conversations. So um, we're going to take a moment and uh, have pause. And when we come back, we're going to add uh, two of our towering elders in this long arc of intellectual work and institution building, particularly in black spaces, uh, Andrew and Amy Billingsley, to uh, help us push a little bit further into this question of the history of HBCUs, particularly given their lens coming in to that work during the Black Power Movement, the Black Studies Movement, and how they how they move to transform uh, this these institutions so that that second curriculum Dr. Favors is talking about can come out of the shadows and perhaps occupy center stage. So back in the morning. Make sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table. I'm Greg Carr. And when we paused, uh, Dr. Jelani Favors at North Carolina ENT uh, really laid the foundation for our conversation today by helping us understand not only the history of HBCUs, but the central role that historically Black colleges have played and the central role of faculty at historically black colleges, the central role they have played in shaping generations of young black people in conducting research, in helping to shape the intellectual thrust of black community. Um, and, and not only doing all that, but also as a byproduct, as he, as he writes, helping to transform the uh, American project, the American experiment, one that never imagined that people of African descent would be doing any of what we're doing today. And with that, in mind, we're going to now invite into the conversation two people who we are very excited about not only having, but helping us understand 
um, helping us understand how this process unfolded during and in the wake of the period that Jelani Favors just uh, laid out for us, which was the late 1960s, early 1970s, when students, faculties, communities around the United States at HBCUs rose to contest not only the uh, in inequities in American society, but to contest the very idea of what HBCU should be doing to uplift, improve, prepare black communities, not only in the United States, but around the world. So we're going to invite uh, Dr. Andrew Billingsley, Professor Amy Billingsley into this conversation. And as we do, want to evoke uh, Professor Billingsley, uh, Professor Andrew Billingsley, uh, an article that was just published in the fall 2021 issue of the Black Scholar. Uh, this article uh, was introduced by and uh, annotated by uh, our sister, another of our colleagues at Howard University in the Department of African American Studies, uh, Dr. Amy Yobois, um, Howard University and the Challenge of the Black University. This was a conversation that we had with you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Billingsley, Andrew Billingsley, around what in the world you all were trying to accomplish in the late 1960s and early 1970s uh, by converting in some ways Howard University to an example, not of the only black university, but one of the black universities. And so we're gonna continue in the first topic in terms of the history of HBCUs, but we wanna do it, if you all don't mind, um, in a kind of free flowing way where you all help us understand how you were recruited from the West Coast with, uh, with the idea that you were going to go to a, a black institution that was literally being built from the ground up, namely the Institute of the Black World, uh, the great Vincent Harding and others. But some, and then you got a phone call from a young college president who had just <laughs> been recruited himself out of North Carolina, where Professor Favors is, of course, James Cheek at Shaw, to come to Howard University and answer the call to build a black university. And then he turned the keys over to you all, and you went and recruited dozens, over 100 faculty members, some of whose names we know, Joyce Ladner and Ron Walters, to be the kind of faculty that trained Jelani and I. So if you if you two wouldn't take wouldn't mind taking a few minutes, could you walk us through what was going through y'all's minds in the late 60s as y'all were sitting there at Berkeley? And, and then how, how did you what were you trying to accomplish at that at that moment in time and space? Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you very much, Brother Greg, uh, for that kind introduction. Greg, everybody needs to know, is my boss uh, at Howard <laughs> University. He, uh, he brought me back to Howard when I was still down in. Um, South Carolina. But to get into your question, let me first um, say a couple of things about my background, how I got how I got to Howard. <clears throat> I was born in Marin, Alabama in 1926 in a poor family. We survived the Depression. Uh, and then I went to the Army, U.S. Army for a couple of years, and then because of the Army experience, I got something called the GI Bill of Rights. Otherwise, I would not have been able to go to college. So I went to college, and where did I go? I went to the, one of the premier black colleges, Hampton. It was called Hampton Institute at the time. And so I've kept in touch with that. The, what I got at Hampton was a head start, not only into higher education, but into black higher education. And I went on from one school to another until I finally got a job teaching at the University of California in Berkeley. Now the Berkeley experience in the 70s was still almost an all white university, except after the uh, death of Dr. King, they began to miss a few black students. And unfortunately for them, when the black students came, the, the five or six black students came with the message. They said, let's create a new black division within this white university. As you can imagine, that was very, very hard to do and very much opposed to uh, by the establishment of that university. But anyhow, with their leadership, 
I was brought into the office of the chancellor to help them build that black studies program. And it succeeded wonderfully among them, one of the first in the country. And so that's how I got my start as an educator, as a black educator, uh, holding up, lifting up the black experience. When I look at the black college experience from Howard looking backward and from Howard looking forward, the black institution college is a unique institution. It is especially unique for black students. For when black students come into, step into a black college or university, they experience something that they had only experienced before in the black church. That is, they were surrounded by black excellence and black devotion uh, to our people. And this was a unique experience for those students and for the teachers as well, well in those institutions. So when she came to Howard, he came because the students at Howard, as they had begun doing all, all around the country, began to demand change. They began to, black, to demand more black education, more black courses, more black faculty. And although Howard was on his way there, Howard was sort of standing still um, in the, uh, uh, the 1970s. Um, and so when she came, he came with the mission of actually changing the university, building on the university, making it what he called an institution of excellence by anybody's measure. <laughs> so by black, we did not mean anything inferior. We meant something superior to what they had been getting before. And so that's what we set out to do uh, in the 1970s. I must say that the uh, students at Howard University at that time, and indeed in most black colleges and universities from that time until now, get a unique experience. First of all, they're surrounded by black excellence for the first time. All around them are black scholars, black administrators, black workers, um, and they are they are in, in, embroiled in this ocean of black excellence. And after a few years in that kind of uh, institution, they are therefore trained to go on and build on that excellence, and uh, and 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 lift other people up. We we came to Howard with the idea of teaching students to climb the ladder, but also to look back and lift as they climb, make sure that they pave the way for other people to move ahead as well. And so President Cheek used to say, we strive for excellence. We strive for excellence by anybody's measure. And we strive for black excellence standing on the shoulders of those ancestors that uh, uh, have gone before us. Hmm. And at Howard, we stood on the shoulders of those who came before us and built an institution that, as she used to say, excellent by anybody's measure. And one of the things that struck me when I came from Seventh to Howard is, although Howard was called a university, Except for the medical school and the law school, it did not produce many high level professionals. There were no PhD programs, for example, in the social sciences, the humanities, the arts. And for example, although there were some very distinguished black PhDs like E. Franklin Frazier, Ralph Bunch, and so on, they got their PhDs somewhere else. They didn't get them at Howard. There were no PhDs being offered in those fields. So my job, according to President Cheek, was to develop doctoral programs 
and built on the strong undergraduate programs that had existed at Howard for some time. And so we set about, as Greg says, we set about building uh, programs and, and institutes uh, and, and teaching PhD scholars. I was told recently uh, by the uh, uh, archivist at Howard that Howard University still produces more black PhDs than any other single university in the country or in the world. So starting from a low level, we moved it forward step by step uh, into the uh, realm of high levels of excellence. I must also say, and, and introducing Amy, I must say that the black college has been united with the black church. Mm. The black church and the black college are the pre premier institutions in the black community that have been stepping stones for black people the world over. Amy might be able to tell you a little bit about her black church, which is still uh, striving to move mountains. Amy? We belong to a church in Alexandria called the Alfred Street Baptist Church. And a, uh, Alfred Street has every year, uh, founded by Wilma Roscoe, who used to be at Nafio, uh, a, black, a black college fair every year that has about 70 HBCUs and has, oh, hundreds, uh, I guess, last count is probably about a million, well, maybe not a million, maybe several hundred thousand students that come through and talk with representatives of those universities and hear different programs, uh, introducing them to black college uh, presidents, uh, back college presidents and life. So I'm very pleased to be associated with uh, a university that does, a church that does so much. Alfred Street was founded in 1803, of course, by members that got together as a church uh, and, and got together for um, uh, education, emphasizing education and they continue to do so. They gave, recently they gave a million dollars to the museum, National Museum of African American History and Culture. And uh, they continue to do wonderful groundbreaking things like that in the fields of religion and education. I want to say also that um, our family not only worked in black colleges and boosted black colleges, but it became a family affair. For example, our daughter, uh, Benita, that we're visiting down here now, uh, went to Spelman College. Mm. Uh, her husband, Cadillac Harris, a very distinguished football coach, uh, and went to Norfolk State College. And their daughter, Cheyenne Harris, now goes to Spelman College. So. Black colleges are in our lifeblood. And while we're visiting down here, we visit a neighbor, the um, family, Martel Perry, Martel Perry, Perry who, uh, whose father was at Hampton with me. So he studied engineering while I studied uh, sociology. So we're surrounded by the Black college and Black church experience. Excellent. I want to ask you all one uh, more question and then we'll, we'll take a break and we come back. Uh, Brother Jelani and I will, uh, we'll, we'll all be in, in round table conversation or, and tease out some of these issues. And um, for those of you who may not be aware of when you heard Professor Amy Billingsley talk about NAFIO, that's the National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education. Another of your longtime uh, dear friends and colleagues, of course, the great Sam Myers, once the president of Bowie State University, he recently made transition at 101. So uh, y'all still youngsters compared to Dr. Myers. Uh, um, uh, of course, led that institution for years, a former HBCU president. But as you all were talking, I want to ask you just very quickly and thank you. Um, and for those of you who, as I said, have not, uh, yet gotten uh, Andrew Billingsley Scholar and Institution Builder 
uh, where a number of you all's uh, colleagues, people you recruited, contributed chapters. Um, and of course, it's published by a black owned publisher, the great William Paul Coates, Black Classic Press, uh, of course, a black institution. Um, as you as you were talking about that work, developing those PhD programs, training those scholars, um, a, a couple of things came to mind. Uh, Randy Matori, who's down there at Duke, the Rand Matori's book, Stigma and Culture, where he talks about this class issue at HBCUs. And he focuses on Howard, where his father was for many years on faculty at the medical school. And he said that um, the struggle at many HBCUs, and he, he kind of spotlights Howard in this, was to avoid what he calls last place anxiety. So he talks about black folk coming from the Caribbean, coming from Africa, and he, he talks about that concentration, particularly at the medical school, where there's this kind of class division around, around law, around medicine, and you know, the HBCUs, whether it be Meharry, you know, Morehouse Schools of Medicine, um, you, you, you have that professional class. But then he says, there are this, this, this other surge of black folk who are coming to get an education, to uplift their community, who are coming from lower down in the class strata. And as you were talking, uh, as you all were talking, one of the questions that, that came to mind for me, particularly since you made the connection between the HBCUs and the black church, you know, how were you, how did you all try to address that question of not just access to higher education, but helping us kind of break down what really has emerged since the uh, Black Power era, the Civil Rights Black Power era, movement era. These class divisions and class tensions, uh, particularly even at HBCUs. I mean, you all did a lot of work uh, during those years of recruiting this faculty to really begin to focus lenses. And you mentioned Dr. Billingsley, and those of you who, uh, when, you, when you get this book, you'll see uh, in every area, social work, uh, the humanities, as we heard uh, Janani talk about a minute ago, um, the, all across the social sciences, uh, the creation of the Howard University Press, uh, WHUR and WHUT, radio station, television station. How did you all try to create a different vision of higher education that would have people come through and receive training, not just to improve their individual lives or their families' lives, but ultimately to kind of shape a different concept of the black community rather than just replicating the very highly class stratified um, model of, of, of white society and white and white uh, white universities. Did you all have any problems around class tensions as they emerged? Um, not at Howard at that time. Mm. I understand before that there had been a certain amount of class tension, but you must remember that when we came to Howard in the late sixties and the seventies, it was a revolutionary time, and black people all over the country beginning to rise up uh, and stand on each other's shoulders. Um, Sheik used to say to um, us uh, and the students. Uh, he used to challenge the students by saying, um, your, your reach must be higher than your grasp or what's the heaven for? In mm. other words, he challenged the faculty and the students to move beyond whatever was ordinary, to reach for the stars. Um, and so that's what we did. We didn't have any white model to go after. We were, we were, we were going to be excellent by anybody's measure. And so that, 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 that pushed us on uh, and led us on uh, to higher heights. Wow. That's very powerful. That is, that, that is extremely, in fact, let's use that as a, as a launching point. If you all don't mind, when we return from our break, we're going to come and talk about the present status of HBCUs and Wow, that's a, to articulate that vision of a model of excellence that doesn't take as its precedent or as its foundation um, external notions of excellence, but it's literally looking within, tapping within. I think it's a very powerful point of departure. And we'll, when we come back in a moment, we'll talk about the current state of HBCUs and maybe we'll, you know, Jelani, uh, um, you and I in conversation with the Billingsleys can 
talk through and think through what of that thrust continues today, what we may have lost track of and, you know, what we may have contributed to that in this moment. So back in a minute. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? back to the black table today's uh, inaugural topic uh, the past present and future of historically black colleges and universities our guests are professor andrew and amy billingsley professor jelani favors myself um and what we left off a moment ago uh with the billingsley's articulating the compelling vision the compelling vision of excellence service to uh, black communities that transcended any reliance on an external model that drew on the long intellectual traditions of black institutions, HBCUs, the black church, and so many other black institutions for the foundation for what uh, was given voice and flower as Dr. Andrew Billingsley says, during a revolutionary time in the 1970s in the United States and the world of the black university. So um, we're gonna now convene virtually what we would do in person around our black table, we're now going to convene now um, a kind of bit of a conversation around the present status of HBCUs. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, my brother, ask our brother uh, Jelani Favors, um, a first rate scholar, teacher, uh, servant who is firmly anchored in HBCUs and now occupies a name chair at his alma mater. Um, as, as, as the Billingsleys were talking, uh, Jelani, I'm sure a lot of stuff went through your mind, brother. So I'm just going to uh, ask you <laughs> to make some remarks, maybe ask some questions, and we're going to have a bit of a conversation there in this video. Go ahead, brother. I want to come back to this issue of class that you raised, because I think it's such a pressing issue. And you and I have often joked about uh, the fact that we were products of of the field Negro tradition, right? Yes, <laughs> you know, sir. We went to, to state institutions. Yes, sir. Tennessee State, uh, uh, North Carolina a t Florida a and Yes, you know, sir. These, these, these were institutions um, which, uh, yes, classism existed within these spaces. Colorism existed within these spaces. Paternalism, there's all these type of isms that thrive uh, within these spaces, but they never overshadow the, the, the mission 
uh, and the purpose of, of black colleges, particularly as it related to questioning um, white supremacy and Jim Crow. Um, but you and I were products of those spaces and we both were trained uh, by a man who was a product of this space as well, Dr. William Nelson Jr. Yes, sir. Uh, who went on to teach at Ohio State University, one of the founders of the Black Studies Program uh, at Ohio State University. And Dr. Nelson um, used to always tell us in class, uh, we would be sitting in his political science classes and you know, he would uh, sometimes seem as though he was falling asleep. You know, we're sitting here talking about this different work, and 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 Dr. Nelson, we would wonder like, is Dr. Nelson up? Is he is he is he listening to what we're saying? And all of a sudden, Dr. Nelson would, would spring to life, and, and one of the overarching um, constant questions um, that he would pepper us with is, what does this have to do with the liberation of Black people? Whatever it is that we were reading, whatever it is that we were discussing, he would always bring it back to what does this have to do with the liberation of black people? And in fact, he he would ask us that so much that we began to start calling it the Nelsonian question. Like, <laughs> what does this have to do with the liberation of black people? And I think that that's the, the pressing uh, and, and, and overarching um, issues surrounding the legacy of black colleges is what have they had to do with the liberation of black people? And I think the Billingsleys has, have already perfectly uh, um, illustrated the fact that they have meant everything to the struggle for black liberation. So my question to Dr. Billingsley um, would be to, to discuss that transition going from Howard over to the state institution of Morgan State. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if it was Morgan State University at the time or whether it was still yeah. Morgan College. Um, but I would love to know what that meant for you in your career uh, and how you brought that purpose, that mission of channeling the energy of the Black Power era into Morgan State and, and what kind of ideas and what type of uh, uh, um, new concepts did you bring to Morgan State in the, I believe you were there in the, in the 80s, right? 70s and 80s, you were there? Yeah. Um, yeah, from, talk about from, that transition a little bit and, 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 and your legacy at Morgan State and, and okay. what it had to do with the liberation of black people. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, you're, you're using that expression reminded me that Ron Walters, one of the premier scholars that I recruited to Morgan, I mean to Howard, used that expression uh, as a basis for his um, mission at Howard. Uh, he would challenge the students and the faculty and the administration with the question, what has this got to do with the liberation of black people? Right. Not, he so much believed in that as a motivating uh, mantra that he titled one of his books. Yeah. What has this got to do with the liberation of black people? So that's Ron Ross's and that's Howard. I was um, attracted to come to Morgan University from Howard in 1975, because there had been a, a proposal in the state legislature to elevate Morgan State College to Morgan State University. That was the new idea for, for Maryland, a black university. So I went there with the purpose of helping to lead that movement. And it was very hard at first, I mean, the state legislature didn't understand what a black university was. The governor who controlled everything didn't understand what a black university was. And some of our own people didn't understand. <laughs> but, but with the students uh, primarily and the faculty, we were able to chisel together the concept of a new black university in the state of Maryland. And we made the transition from college to university in the first three years uh, of my tenure uh, uh, leadership. And then since that time, the institution has been building block by block, program by pro program on top of each other. It is now one of the largest institutions in the state, one of the, among the largest black uh, universities, um, and it has a very strong financial footing. Uh, it was a struggle when I was there to raise money from the state but since that time, the uh, students from the four black universities uh, hired some lawyers 
and sued the state uh, for underfunding and for duplicating black programs at white universities. And so after three or four years, they were successful. And I don't know how many millions of dollars they now have to uh, spread among those four black colleges to keep on building. And the new president of, of uh, Morgan has uh, continued the fantastic vision that we started the university with. And I would say Morgan is now among the largest uh, black institutions and increasingly among the strongest. We are taught uh, to lift while we climb and we are taught to uh, strive for excellence and they're doing just that 40 years after I left. Another thing I'd say about um, the black colleges um, is that they, we haven't mentioned it much, but they had a, 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 um, a very difficult beginning after the Civil War, and they have always been underfunded. Mm. They have always had to do with less, and they have always shown a remarkable talent uh, to do more with less. Um, and one of the things we discovered at Howard, I discovered that not only did we um, try to raise money from the, from the federal government uh, and from student tuition. But uh, while I was there and before I was there, there was no effort to raise funds from this alumni. Hmm. And uh, I remember uh, the uh, some of the alumni were able to, to give. You know, they were doctors and lawyers and business people, but they didn't have the habit of giving f funds back to the university. I'm now pleased to note that there is now a trickle, more than a trickle, uh, of giving back. Um, when Greg and those people and Amy gave my 90th birthday party at uh, Howard, um, one of the students who came to that party gave a contribution of $2,000. Another student gave a contribution of $3,500. And that was sort of like a beginning of a new movement of alumni giving back uh, to the universities. Um, and now at Morgan, uh, not only a new alumni started to give, it is not yet uh, up to where it should be, but at least three black millionaires have given more than a million dollars uh, to Morgan. Uh, and the state has increased its appropriation. And the students, the former students at the four black colleges in Maryland, Morgan, Coppin, Morgan, UMES. UMES, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Uh, they, uh, they, they got together and hired some lawyers to sue the state for uh, discriminating against the black colleges and underfunding them and taking programs away from the black colleges and giving them to the universities. It took four or five years to win that suit. But last year they won it, and they have hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to now be spread from the state that's not going to be spread among those four black colleges. So it pays to strive, to work hard, and to believe, to believe that it's possible. And the, the black colleges, along with the black churches, are the best examples of that mantra. Hey, Greg, Greg, if you don't mind, can I just come no, back? No, please, please, by all means. Because, I mean, again, these are just some incredible nuggets that you're delivering to yeah. us. Uh, um, doctor and Mrs. Uh, doc, the doctors, Billingsley. Um, and in fact, I would love to hear Amy jump in on, on this question as well, because again, your husband has already kind of teased this out. When you look at these institutions, you're looking at legacies of black excellence, you're looking at legacies of black empowerment, but you're also looking at the legacy living embodiment of segregation. Right. It's very clear that these institutions have been underfunded, deliberately underfunded by years by both the federal government, the state government, local. I mean, there's a discrepancy when you walk on a, a campus like Tennessee State University and then go to uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. It's very clear right, that there has been a, a massive funding discrepancy and a funding gap. But we're beginning to see some templates, some blueprints being established of how these institutions can, and I would argue should, be seeking restitution and even a form of reparation through funding. Do you believe, uh, Dr. Amy Billingsley, if, that that is the trajectory that these institutions should be on, that, that every last one of them should be saying, hey, pay us what you owe us. Uh, and, and this has been a, 
Uh, and it, I, I think it's great that you bring in alumni donors and uh, alumni giving. That's critically important, but we also clearly see a massive funding gap as it relates to um, what the legacy of, of racist state legislatures have done to try to um, uh, slow down the progress of these institutions. Can we see moving forward or should we expect moving forward other HBCUs following suit and pressing for some form of economic restitution from the state? Absolutely. And it's very uh, clear that HBCUs have donated to the country a very special kind of service. And the uh, under underprivileged African Americans that go to these schools have a different uh, enlightenment that also has been extremely beneficial to the community, to the schools, and to the country. So I, I think it's absolutely important that these schools be funded as they should be because they do bring such an important dimension to education, to communities, and to the country. And as you said, Delaney, funding for all sources, funding from the federal government. I mean, the federal government should provide more than this, the, the token amount they now provide to these colleges because the uh, colleges, wherever they're located, contribute to the nation. And so there is a movement now to try to increase uh, under the Biden administration the amount of the federal appropriation to all of these uh, black colleges. And that is a good move. But it's also important, I think, for the uh, well-to-do black uh, graduates from these schools to contribute their fair share to building these institutions as well. Well, y'all are really trying to tear the floorboards up on these conventional conversation on HBCUs. This is so important. Uh, those of you all who are tuning in, this is the Black Table, it, particularly if you have young people and if you're interested in institutions, this is an invaluable conversation we're having right now, an, an intergenerational dialogue on HBCUs. Uh, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, um, let's pick up, if we can, with what we just heard. Uh, my brother Jelani Favors, Professor Favors, brother Jelani Rays, and we heard the Billingsleys kind of sketch out in terms of this infusion of resources um, at HBCUs, particularly public HBCUs. Uh, of course, the $577 million uh, settlement in the Maryland lawsuit and being kind of the one that's leading the news today as it relates to what those resources can and should be devoted to at HBCUs and, and, and more. So back in a minute. Our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. I love y'all. All momentum we have now 
We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table. When uh, we left, we were in a conversation with Jelani Favors, Andrew Billingsley, Amy Billingsley, uh, around the issue of resources for HBCUs and uh, what that can translate into in terms of us being able to do more with more. So let's bring let's bring our uh, conversions into the, the, the conversation again, and we'll, we'll kind of end today by raising this question, we, we all have seen the news. Uh, Dr. Billingsley, you mentioned the $577 million lawsuit that was settled in the state of Maryland, uh, which is the latest in an iteration of uh, legal warfare. I think about our friend Alvin Chambliss down in Mississippi, Ayers versus Fordyce from years ago, the Tennessee case, the Geyer case, where you see an attempt to get resources for public HBCUs, at least. Um, Harold Ford uh, Jr., who's in the Tennessee legislature, saying that, you know, this is the money that's owed to public HBCUs in, in Tennessee. And we've also seen in the wake of the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Maude Aubrey, this kind of racial reckoning as it's been characterized and a lot of foundation support. You know, Ralph Lauren giving money, Disney talking about they giving money, people putting money in. Um, how should those resources be deployed? And I want to tie that to Jelani with your discussion of the second curriculum and those master teachers who are versed the invisible, you know, when universities get a windfall of resources, whether it be through foundation support or whether it be through um, uh, private donations or even increased state funding, how should those resources be best deployed at HBCUs to support that second curriculum, this black university concept, this excellence without white models concept. And we've also seen finally celebrity hires, so to speak, you know, Nicole Hannah-Jones and ta Coates at, 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 at Howard. Uh, on the athletic side, Deion Sanders at Jackson State. Uh, you know, uh, what's the brother's name? Hugh Jackson at Grambling. Uh, Eddie George at Tennessee State. How, how best should we seize this moment now in terms of the future of HBCUs as it relates to resources? Y'all have some thoughts on that? I do. Um, you know, I, I think it boils down to this question again, uh, to the Nelsonian question, right? You know, what do, what do these spaces have to do with the liberation of Black people? I've said this over and over again in different spaces that I've been in talking about HBCUs. You know, Black colleges have made incredible contributions um, to this country, um, culturally, um, socially, economically. Um, but the most important contribution that Black colleges have made has been in the transformation of American democracy itself. Um, these institutions, um, and Dr. Billingsley's have already raised the, the critical importance of the black church, um, but these pillar institutions of the black church and HBCUs have served as a catalyst for every major social movement in American history. And the, the power behind that was not only a second curriculum, it was the humanities and social sciences at these institutions. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, we live in, in, in a moment where so much attention, um, even now with all of this, this windfall, <laughs> as you classified, of, <laughs> of philanthropic support. And I say windfall with air quotes because, again, much of what's being given is still a, a drop in the bucket compared to what so many PWIs garner on, on, a, yearly, on a yearly basis in terms of financial support. But so much of this funding is going to propping up STEM programs. Uh, and, and again, as I often say in so many of these talks, this is not to denigrate the importance of STEM. We need black folks in STEM, um, but we also need HBCUs to never forget the legacy of the humanities and social sciences and how it produced critical thinkers like the Billingsleys and, and others, you know, who again, 
embrace sociology and history and political science uh, and, and African-American studies, black studies emerges uh, in large part to so many of the intellectual tra traditions that were already going on within HBCU spaces. And so we want to continue to make HBCUs relevant for the 21st century and for a new generation. We have to find a way to reinvigorate um, the humanities and social sciences at HBCUs. I've been in conversation with my good friend, Dr. Melanie Price at Prairie View A&M, who left, just like myself, left <laughs> Rutgers uh, yes. and went home to her alma mater, which is Prairie View. And now she is leading up the Ruth Simmons Center for Race and Social Justice. Um, but Ruth Simmons is coming to Prairie View um, and she gets it. She understands that there's a legacy of intellectual tradition of producing radicalism and dissent that has questioned on white supremacy in America. And the only way that we're going to continue that tradition is by funding the humanities and social sciences. So when she opens up her Rolodex, she's calling friends not to say, hey, write us a, a half a million dollar check for, for this new engineering program. We want you to fund these centers for race and social justice. We want you to fund the arts and, and, and the humanities and social sciences at these institutions because they are just as vitally important, if not more vitally important, to the legacy and tradition of what these institutions have done in reshaping the social and political contours of America. So if we want a new generation of young Black people to come through these spaces. And again, if you want to go into STEM, you want to go to engineering and, and computer sciences, that's fine. But you also need to understand the legacy of racial responsibility. You also need to understand the legacy of countering and questioning white supremacy wherever you find it. You know, no matter what boardroom you're in or, 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 or no matter what classroom you, you happen to come into, right? You need to have the mental fortitude uh, and, and, and the intellectual skills uh, to be able to articulate and, and, and call out uh, um, white supremacy and, and racist thinking uh, and, 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 and to question it and, and to an attempt to try to radically redefine these spaces. And I think that's what HBCUs have been about and the humanities and social sciences have been a large part of that. And so we need to find a way to spread that funding uh, into those spaces if we want to continue to see these institutions serving um, the vital role that they have played in the past. Thank you, brother. And we're going to give the, uh, the last word to the Billingsleys and perhaps we can use it to walk across to you all um, the bridge that uh, that Professor Favors just built in part by evoking the name of Ruth Simmons, a true academic mm -hmm. who led Ivy League institutions, of course, that daughter of the South, who's gone to Prairie View and modeled for us again in the great tradition of the Mary Bethunes and the Benjamin Mazes and some of that from our generation who have tried to aspire to that, like a Walter Kimbrough at, at, at Dillard. The, the idea that HBCU leadership, administrative leadership should have uh, a deep intellectual foundation, one that transcends this kind of uh, profit motive dri driven more, uh, j labor market, job market driven uh, attitude toward HBCUs. So with that in mind, as, as two educators and institution builders who absolutely had and have that foundation and framework, any thoughts on the future of HBCUs from where you all sit? I, I, I'm I, not going to let y'all retire, so I'm just... <laughs> I'm just <laughs> so go ahead. I think, Greg, that in, um, in looking toward the future, we should always try to build it uh, in recognition uh, of the past. I mean, after the end of slavery, who would have thought that there were black men and women later who could lead states, whole states, my, my work in South Carolina? I mean, for a dozen years, you know, there were black leadership of the whole state. They didn't have to go and in school to learn that. Uh, they learned it by living. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we started black studies programs at white universities uh, in, in 70, uh, 68, 69, the model already existed. There were already black colleges teaching about black people, black history, about Africa, about Du Bois, about Fraser, and so on, and so on. So we need to look at these institutions not only as um, 
um, underfunded, uh, underdeveloped, under whatever, but as pioneers and as leaders in setting forth new ways of looking at the African-American experience and at the experience of African-Americans in the country and in the world at large. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Andrew Billingsley. Professor Amy Billingsley, do you have any final comments before we... <laughs> and by the way, do, do you offer, don't sleep on that Alpha Street HBCU Fair. It's the, it's the country's largest. If you young people don't know about that, maybe even help us understand for young people how they can be become a part of that annual fair as well, if you don't mind, in, in addition to whatever else you, you have on your mind. Okay. Um, I think it happens in February, uh, and it's a matter of just joining it. You can go on the website and get information about how to uh, be in touch with it, but it's, it's uh, incredible how much you can learn from HBCUs and what HBCUs have to offer, which to me reminds me that one of the big uh, advantages of HBCUs is they don't just take the cream of the crop. They take some very important uh, people who have not, maybe haven't even learned to read some of them. Their parents have not learned to read. And they are able to educate those people and bring them up to do important things. Like Ruth Simmons, for example. She grew up as a sharecropper, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And she uh, was one of 18 family members, 18 children, and she has done incredible things. So they're just very important aspects of all ranges of our black community. Um, here at my, uh, my uh, son's house, um, he has, they're, they're working, <laughs> I think thanks to the history makers in part, but they're working on a lot of different ways of understanding the black experience. And he's working on Elizabeth, uh, Virginia Beach, they, they have the churches put in five cents, 10 cents, 20 cents, different small amounts of money in order to start schools because they felt education was so important. So it's just, I think that our people have just done some amazing things and it's so important that we're now getting our, our lion is now getting our story out. Yes. Yes, that's a perfect way to, to pause. As you say, uh, Professor Billingsley, until lions have historians, the hunters will always be heroes. So finally, the lion, so finally the lions are getting this story out and the black table is one of those spaces. Thank you again to uh -huh. legends, uh, Andrew and Amy Billingsley, um, one of our master teachers in our generation, Brother Jelani Favors, and like Brother Jelani and me, the HBCUs took us in. So we're going to do our best to continue to look back as we go forward. And this isn't the end of this conversation. This is just a pause in this moment of the Black Table. But we certainly want to invite you all back um, because we've picked so many topics. And thank you all so much uh, for joining us. Um, I will end with this. Um, this is our inaugural uh inaugural uh, meeting convening of the black table and as i said at the beginning of this our our objective is to help broaden these conversations create a different kind of lens and leave us with different ways of thinking so that we can have different ways of moving and acting through the world um thank you to the entire staff at black star network and to everyone who is participating in this and this is what independent black media looks like so support us and we'll see you all next time around the black table.